But usually you go on and there's a, a set of species accounts that gives very detailed information. And really I didn't find that in this set of monographs. It was more a summary. So I went to another monograph that I know a bit better. Uh, this is Birds of the Northern Petén. The Petén is the, the Yucatan Peninsula and its base in Mexico and Guatemala. Um, and so here, this is a very nicely structured monograph. Scientific name, authority, common name, which are silly things that bird people do. Uh, and then look at this, a locality and some information, date, numbers, another locality, date and numbers. We don't care about measurements for this purpose. Here's another one, locality, U of M, that's probably U of Michigan. Um, and you can see this is a nice list of biodiversity data. And so your only challenge is how to get those data out. So whereas the specimens were highly distributed and dispersed, the monograph is highly centralized, okay? You've got some technical problems in how to get the data out of the monograph, because they're usually old books. Um, those technical problems can be addressed, either by brute force, which is to say you sit down and you capture the data, or potentially by technological means, scan, uh, optical character recognition, and then essentially searching that raw text for you know, records from the Cameroon Mountains, Moses. Um, so the drawbacks of the monograph are that it ends at some point, you know, 1932 for the birds of the Belgian Congo. Uh, I don't remember the date of this, but it's early, early 20th century. Um, but you at least have one expert giving you a consistent view of the taxonomy. Many regions don't have a monograph, and many monographs don't provide the data in the format that you really want the data. Okay, this is, this is somehow secondary, right? This is, um, you know, Vinago Calva is in this district. Yeah, but I want the point data. I want to know whether it was one specimen or 50. I want to know the dates, et cetera. So some monographs give you that, some don't. So then, as you well know, we can also go online and get the data that we're wanting. Um, essentially, the progression approximately was that by the 1980s, a lot of major collections were capturing their data digitally, but there really wasn't a good way of sharing those data. So we would do things like, you know, write letters and ask for a, a disk to be, uh, you know, to have a, an Excel file put on it. And then that would be mailed back. And then later it would be emailed back. And then collections were able to put up searchable databases online into the 1990s, but it was extremely inefficient because um, one collection would use one field structure and another collection would use another field structure. So you'd get you know, a date in one format and a date in another format, and you would have to combine those very different data sets so a very key step, and this is really a subject for another course, but a key step was the development of a common vocabulary, and this was called Darwin Core. And that was actually done in the building next to where my office is, uh, the first version. Um, and essentially it was a bunch of people who worked in collections getting together and saying, how do you communicate the essence, not every last detail. Okay, like mammal people measure how long the ear is and how long the foot is, and that's not really the essence. The, I mean, as Arturo said, it's really what species, where, when. 
And then you can throw in some ancillary data, numbers of individuals, sex, age, things like that. But really the essence is what, where, and when. And so the Darwin core revolved around developing a relatively small list of, of fields that could describe the what, where, and when of a biodiversity record fairly efficiently. And the Darwin core grew over the years because, you know, uh, people who work in aquatic systems said, well, we need to describe depth. Oops. All of a sudden, it's not latitude, longitude, but it's latitude, longitude, depth. And while you're at it, elevation, because there are some organisms that are above the ground. And then the paleontologist said, oh, but we need stratum. And so everybody kind of added and tweaked and such and such. And then eventually, the Darwin core was turned into an international standard. And so that's very nice because now it is, um, it is documented and it's quite, <coughs> quite formal. And so building on that, um, first there were North American efforts and South American efforts, NABIN and Species Analyst in North America, Species Link, which you guys have seen in South America. Um, that turned into vertebrate networks in North America and then eventually GBIF was born, and now you have networks kind of around the world. The Australians were very big early on also. Um, the biggest, but as you've already seen, not necessarily the most quality controlled, is GBIF. And this is a half a billion records. So it's unbelievable. It's massive. You know, and you say, oh, but the amount of error. Yeah, but oh, but the amount of information. So what really matters is not the amount of error, but rather this, the ratio of signal to noise, okay? And there are ways that certainly GBIF could invest time and resources in reducing the noise, but um, very generally, it's a, it's a spectacular resource. So just for fun, I did a GBIF query on Uganda. Uh, 345 data sets contribute data on Ugandan biodiversity. 171,304 records. Um, and those data are coming from 26 countries. Okay? Now, as I said, those data are a bit frustrating. Um, worldwide, there are the data, so there are the latitude-longitude coordinates associated with the country code Uganda. So you see we have some problems, okay? And even, you know, kind of regionally, and even uh, Africa-wide, we're, you know, some of these we might be able to guess at what the problem is. I'm wondering about a north-south problem. Um, but, Right away, you can see one of the problems, which is that you have to work a lot more on data cleaning. If you contrast the work between this and working with data from a monograph, some poor soul 100 years ago dedicated his or her life to developing that monographic synthesis, the birds of or the, the reptiles of and did that data cleaning for you. You know, you still have to do data cleaning in the sense of making sure that the geographic, uh, georeferencing is correct, and that there weren't typographic errors inserted and things like that. But really, that is the value of essentially working with a curated data set. Now the value of working with this is that it's a huge amount of data, and that you can uh, take advantage of sources that the monographer didn't have access to. So it's all a balance. And then the, the last source that I wanted to lay out for you is that of de novo field work. And so I figured I'd show you a few pictures of um, my own field work. Um, and this <coughs> was my most recent expedition, which was too long ago, in Mongolia. And so you're in Central Asia. Um, and essentially, this belt is, a, is taiga, 
you know, northern boreal forest. And then this belt here is the Gobi Desert. And what I want you to focus on is this kind of third of the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. Those are any records of birds in the global digital accessible knowledge store. And so out of those 500 million records of anything, about 210 million are records of birds. And out of 210 million records of birds, no records there. So over the course of four expeditions, we assembled this uh, set of sampling. And essentially, all of this is that quarter from which there were no data. And at the end of the expedition that I did in 2011, I thought, oh, maybe I'll put together a compendium of the new records at the level of states within Mongolia. And there were so many new records that I wasn't able to finish the compilation. We sent another expedition two years later, and that brought back a whole bunch of new records. So it's literally to the point where, you know, almost all of the information we brought back was a surprising, interesting, or useful record. So it's probably not even worth publishing the paper. The field work was pretty brutal. Um, this is an old Soviet missile transport, which ate gasoline like you can't imagine. Um, broke down maybe every third day, but it, it took us across the country. Um, actually, at this site, this tent, the first night, the wind blows so hard that it, it will pick up a tent and carry it off. <laughs> so I was walking around the truck this way at midnight, and I felt something really big move by me. <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking, you know, horse, uh, you know, something, something like that. And then I realized it was that tent <laughs> with a backpack and sleeping bags inside, <laughs> rolling off into the desert. And two, two guys had to just literally take off running as fast as they could and bring it back. Um, so this was, a, this was a pretty amazing adventure. Those are some of the landscapes. And my favorite was a day spent in an oasis. And I just spent the whole day photographing salt crystals. And there were hundreds of different shapes. Uh, some of the birds. And then we ended up in the Altai Mountains. So this was a highland site. But there were minute forest patches on some of the um, high slopes. And then there was this gallery forest. And so that was the real treat, because those are really seriously isolated Island. So that Altai site is right there. It was then seven days on dirt track to get back to the capital. So, so if you want to do this de novo field work, you did this, Rodrigue, but many times the holes in the coverage are holes in coverage for a very good reason. They're hard to get to. So, it's very expensive, it's time consuming, but the advantage is you control your own fate. You get good data quality, you check the identifications, you check the geographic references. <coughs> so all I'm trying to, to emphasize to you is that we have multiple sources of information and that every single one of them has an advantage and a disadvantage, okay? So with these regional diagnoses, Ideally, what we do is we get comprehensive coverage of existing data. So really what I'm saying is take all three of the, of the, the, all of the first three of the sources that I outlined for you. With that, you can develop an analysis of inventory completeness. Once you have that, you can go on to identify gaps in coverage. And we'll talk about that for the next two days. Once you understand completeness and gaps, you can essentially see what biological lessons can be learned and then go on to translate that into uh, things of interest for biodiversity conservation. 
So that's just kind of intended as a, an umbrella picture uh, for today and succeeding days. Any questions about anything that I've thrown out? <laughs>